so you guys have made it this far in this course. You guys are really brave and determined. And I just want to appreciate that um, at the start here because process and reality is a really difficult book to read. And, you know, I keep reading it because it rewards my effort. And I hope that, um, you know, the effort that you're all putting in is being rewarded as well because uh, it's, it can be a really a hard nut to crack to make sense of what White Ed is doing. And uh, I really relish the opportunity to talk to you guys in real time and to hear what you're struggling with and to try to um, you know, share my own understanding of Whitehead, which continues to, to develop. I mean, it's, it's really a privilege to be able to read this together with all of you because I'm still learning to make sense of what Whitehead is saying. And so when I hear reflected back from each of you, you know, what you're trying to, what you've grokked from his jungle of, of words, um, it's, 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 it's a great opportunity for me to check what I think I understand. So I really, I really do appreciate that you've come along on this journey of learning with me uh, as we try to make sense of this, um, you know, difficult, but I think really important philosopher um, no one said the new paradigm was going to be easy to understand at first, you know, and the new paradigm is a new way of feeling and experiencing and living, but it's also a new way of thinking. And I think, um, we can go a long way in feeling what that new worldview is and intuiting it and even in practicing it, you know, with various new forms of life, um, but to think it is, a, is, a, is another thing also. And Whitehead's helping us develop um, the concepts and the language to be able to not only live and feel and intuit this new organic re-enchanted worldview, but to think it and to be in dialogue with the history of science and the history of mathematics and contemporary science and mathematics. So he's trying to speak the language of physics, the language of logic, uh, you know, the language of geometry. You think, you think it's hard so far. Wait till we get to part four of process and reality. You guys are going to hate me so much. Because <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's basically Whitehead trying to do Euclid's elements over again and like deduce the possibility. He's trying to redefine um, points and lines and planes. And it's going to be, I mean, maybe a few of you will really love it if you have that mathematical background, but I really, I'm not, um, I'm a mathematical dunce. Um, and, you know, I've tried to learn more in order to understand Whitehead better. But, um, you know, all of that is just to say that uh, you've made it this far and that alone deserves a pat on the back. Um, all right, we're finishing up part two of Process and Reality, uh, where Whitehead's engaging with the history of philosophy and trying to bring his new cosmological scheme into dialogue with um, early modern thinkers like Hume and Locke and Descartes and Kant and Newton. And um, hopefully you have at least some, you've read at least one of these figures that he's engaging with, you know, so you can kind of get a sense for how he's um, reinterpreting their ideas. As a reader of the history of philosophy, Whitehead is unique in the sense that he's, um, He's not trying to one up everybody all the time. He's like, wow, yeah, this is a deep insight. And we need to, this is obviously something we need to continue to think with as we move philosophy forward. Um, he's trying to inherit in a positive way this whole history of ideas rather than if you read, you know, Whitehead's buddy Bertrand Russell's history of philosophy, um, you get a totally different picture where it's like white, uh, where it's like Russell's at the top of the mountain looking down at all the other philosophers that he's defeated. Um, and um, championing his modern contemporary understanding and belittling everything that came before him. Um, Whitehead doesn't do that. He's more of a sympathetic reader, even though when he sees something, you know, he, he criticizes these philosophers too, when they let their desire for, um, you know, logical completion or their desire for systematic thinking uh, to outweigh the deliverances of their everyday experience. 
Whitehead really wants to protect experience from the violence of abstraction. And so he's very harsh in his criticisms when he thinks that violent abstractions have um, covered over the obvious facts of, of daily life, right, and practice. So um, I think, oh, one more reminder, and then I just want to open the floor for comments and questions from all of you. Um, a reminder about the, uh, the midterm that's due on October 20th. I've heard from a few of you asking about what exactly I'm expecting of you. And I know I'm pretty brief in the syllabus. I just said, choose a section you know, of uh, processing reality or even just a paragraph of a section and try to summarize what Whitehead is saying in your own words. And I'm asking for a thousand words and feel free to build on a discussion post that you've already made. Um, you don't need to cite anything else except Whitehead. You could draw on Stengers if you want. Um, but I just really want you to zoom in on a, on a piece of this text that we're reading and try to make sense of it. Um, try to explain it to someone who has no idea who Whitehead is. Um, it might be challenging. No, in fact, it will be challenging. But um, give it a go. I think it's a, it's a really... It's a good way to learn. Um, you know, having to write about what a philosopher thinks is a great way to learn philosophy. And so is just having a conversation with other philosophers. So let's do that now. What would be one example? Well, matter. Uh, Whitehead thinks that matter in the sense of inert, um, extended stuff that just mutely indoors, it just kind of sits there in empty space this is the, the Cartesian understanding of matter, right? Whitehead thinks this is one of the most abstract ideas that philosophers have ever imagined. It is, but it's worse than that. It's violent because we treat the world as if it was just matter, right? So, so this abstract understanding of matter has led to a certain economics. It's led to a certain um, way of deploying technology. It's led to a way of you know the whole attempt to master nature yeah and this okay. didn't this didn't all start with descartes you know descartes was formalizing something defining matter in a way that um you know is already sort of prefigured in the bible with its understanding of yeah you know a transcendent designer of just passive stuff um so you know yeah matter is a good example it does violence to our experience because really there's no such thing um in whitehead's conception of the universe there's no matter if you want to talk about um in the way that a materialist will talk about like the answer to the question what is the universe made of whitehead's answer to that question is um well it's complicated but creativity would be a simple way of saying it the universe is made of creativity what is creativity? It's actual occasions of experience, ingressing eternal objects to characterize that experience. And there, these occasions of experience are on an evolutionary adventure into a novel future, right? Um, yeah. That's what the universe is made of. And he thinks that's a less violent, that those are all abstractions. Everything Whitehead is doing is Obviously, he's engaged in the endeavor of, you know, um, coming up with abstract descriptions of reality, but he's trying to think or abstract less violently than the tradition he's inheriting, the modern tradition that he's inheriting. Well, I mean, it's reminding me of something Whitehead says about um, what the, the role of the philosopher is, because, I mean, obviously, most people couldn't care less about philosophy. Um, <laughs> It doesn't mean, though, that they're not philosophers Yeah, in the sense that whenever we, uh, you know, from age seven on, maybe even earlier, human beings start asking why, uh, why, why, why? And as soon as you ask why, you have to give an explanation. And we have certain tools for giving explanations and um, we could, you know, cultivate our capacity to give reasons to give answers to these why questions. And 
some people do cultivate it and, and other people are satisfied with the first answer they hear um, to every question. Um, so, but what's the payoff for Whitehead? I think um, only people who really care about philosophy are ever gonna read Whitehead. And I think Whitehead is, um, you know, philosophy is just a form of um, really weird therapy, I think. Um, and there are very few people for whom process and reality is a therapeutic text to read. But for some of us, it is. If you've read Descartes and you've read, um, you know, you've, you've, you're a scientist who's inheriting the modern scientific worldview, um, who has a certain conception of truth and knowledge, um, and yet is also a human being who has friends and loved ones and um, artistic um, experiences and political ideals. Like, if you're that type of person, if you're living in the modern world, you're going to be having to deal with some contradictions, like that the scientific picture of the world says everything's a machine. And yet in your religious life, in your personal life, in your political life, you believe in freedom, you believe in love, <laughs> you believe in the possibility of some redemption, you know, you believe in the possibility of moral action. That doesn't, all those human presuppositions, presuppositions don't fit with our scientific understanding of the world. And so for someone in that situation, reading Whitehead, I think is very therapeutic, but it's only gonna be therapeutic if you share his, if you share Whitehead's problems. And he not only has the general problem of modern life of like having this whole system of knowledge that says everything is determined by physical laws and having this whole history of literature and political, you know, um, enlightenment and uh, this whole conception of the good life and rom romance and all of this. Um, you could just be an, a normal person and still be struggling with those contradictions, but Whitehead's struggling with contradictions implicit in like geometry and logic and um, not everyone shares those problems, but those problems are not disconnected from, you know, the sort of schizophrenic modern worldview. Those problems are at the metaphysical core of, you know, the modern ailment, you know. Um, so what, when we're doing metaphysics, we're, we're like 25 layers below the level of the common problems that people are facing. But we're trying to get to the core of those problems and um, what's the payoff of that for society? Well, I mean, I don't know, really. I hope there is some payoff. It's the work of, I guess, um, it's a work of translation to make philosophy relevant. You know, it's definitely true that Whitehead's vision of the world with creativity as the ultimate principle and everything, every experience is in relationship to every other experience and thoughts create things. Like Whitehead would affirm all of that but I think he also helps us, and he says science is not a fairy tale. So he also helps us correct for a potential inflation in that worldview where thoughts create things that says, yes, and the conscious person that you think you are, the ego that's having thoughts that then manifest as things, is itself the social achievement of, the, of your body and each cell and each of its thoughts that are creating things and the rest of the universe and all the other actual occasions in our environment that help to give the basic order that our body further organizes and then delivers to our, the conscious occasion of experience that we are in each moment. Yes, thoughts create things, but there's a lot of things. Um, and there, there's a lot of thoughts creating things that are not just us. And this is true for human beings. Like, you know, I could try to call on my parking angel to give me a parking spot downtown but everyone else is calling on a parking angel too. So for me to treat my parking angel and my request for a parking spot and my attempt to make my thought become a thing, that for me to treat that as special is to neglect everyone else's desire for a parking space. Um, but even, you know, for Whitehead, society is not just other humans. It's like the society of cells is composing our body, the society of molecules composing each cell and all the way down to subatomic quantum events 
and all the way up, like this connection between cellular organization and galactic organization um, is, is a ancient um, hermetic principle, right? And so Whitehead's not the first to point this out, but you know, a Whiteheadian worldview is indeed one where freedom is real and where our thoughts have the power to shape reality, um, but always in a social context. I mean, it makes me think that one of the actually really concrete payoffs of Whitehead's metaphysics is um, process theology and the way that that theology, um, you know, percolates into religious communities. Um, you know, say we can say what we will about religious institutions and institutionalized religion and everything, but you know, if I really think if there's any hope for the birth of a new worldview and an ecological world worldview, like a response that's quick enough and transformative enough to the ecological crisis, it's only going to come through our religious institutions. It's got to be a religious revival. And, you know, the, the conservative critics and, and skeptics about climate change are right that ecology is a religion. And I, that's, but the ecologists need to connect with Christianity to get the United States, the country we actually live in, to respond to the ecological crisis. So process theology is the most ecological version of Christianity that you could imagine. And I think, you know, as traumatic, as patriarchal, as repressed and everything else that Christianity, the Christian institutional tradition has, has been, I think we're kind of stuck with it in a way. And, 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 and it might turn out that with a few tweaks here to the underlying metaphysics of it that Whitehead is attempting to do, it, it might turn out to actually really tap into the deep structure of our psyche in a way that is revitalizing and that, is, that, that has the potential to, um, to get people on a mass scale to respond to something like the ecological crisis. So I think process theology as a derivative of Whitehead's thought might be one example of the cash value, to use one of William James's terms, uh, the cash value of Whitehead's very abstract thinking, because it puts people in touch with a different kind of God. And it's not the God that judges from a distance and controls from afar, but um, as White, Whitehead said, it's... Uh, the God, uh, the God who is a fellow sufferer with us, the God who um, operates by love and persuasion rather than coercion uh, and force. So it's, I think, um, yeah, it's, it's worth looking at and it's, it is having an effect um, among liberal Christians in the United States already. And I hope that influence grows because, and, and certainly, you know, Pope Francis is reading Teilhard way more than he's reading Whitehead, but I think what Pope Francis is saying is certainly in line with, with Whitehead's view, though there's still some elements of Pope Francis's Catholic worldview that Whitehead would challenge. Yeah, the subjectivist principle. So this is, we'll start with that, and then we'll work our way through these, these three phases of, um, an actual occasion of experience. But the subjectivist principle is something Whitehead is inheriting from Descartes and from Kant and all the modern philosophers, which is the idea that the nature of reality is such that reality is what is disclosed in the experience of subjects. And outside the experience of subjects, Whitehead says there is nothing, nothing, nothing. <laughs> Very emphatic on that point. Now, of course, just like before, when we think about how thoughts make things. Um, for Whitehead, the subject is not just a human subject anymore. Subjectivity goes all the way down. And so the subjectivist principle for Whitehead is different from Kant's, different from Descartes, because it's now being articulated in a, I guess you could call it a post-human context or a less anthropocentric context at least, where subjectivity pervades the universe not all of it is conscious. In fact, most of it is not. Um, but Whitehead means that when he says 
there's nothing outside the experience of subjects. He means um, that causality itself is an exchange of feelings or a transaction that feels like something. So causality is itself the transfer of feeling between subjects. Now, when he starts to get into what he calls, he calls it a genetic analysis of the experience of a subject, there are these phases, right? Um, a subject or an actual occasion of experience goes through phases. And in fact, one of the phases of a subjective experience is an objective phase. A subject becomes an object when it reaches completion of its experience. But in order to move to that completion, it has to, and this gets to Monica's point, it has to move from potentiality to actuality. Because, you know, and so, so these are the phases of experience now, as Whitehead describes them. We begin uh, inheriting the past, right? And what is the past? Well, Whitehead describes the past as a nexus of occasions that have already perished. And it's sort of a welter of, um, um, of vectors that are all vying for our attention. And in our initial reception of that, all of that, that, that nexus of, of actualities that have already perished, we initially have to find some way of delimiting that, um, that nexus, because it's like a multiplicity of different feelings streaming in. And so our initial response to it, Whitehead says, has to be um, to conform to it, but in conforming to give it some unity. Um, and he calls this the subjective form. Uh, so we receive the objective datum from the past and we respond initially in a conformal way with what he calls a subjective form, which is an emotion of, you know, just uh, joy or um, pain, you, you might say, pleasure or pain, just a very simple sense of like, oh yes, more of that, or no, I don't like that. And, you know, we see this in like a single bacterium, uh, a, a bacterial cell that will swim towards food and away from toxins. Like, um, but Whitehead thinks this, this behavior goes all the way down, right? So not just with life, but this initial capacity to emotionally respond to the past that one receives. This is the conformal phase. And as you move up in the physical world through sort of the scale of complexity, um, Whitehead thinks this, uh, these other phases become more relevant. In the physical world, feeling is mostly conformal. Subjectivity is mostly just repeating what the objective past is giving to it. So it's very repetitive. But as you move up the scale of complexity, especially once you get to living organisms, there's more of a capacity for a conceptual response where there's a contrast between what's still possible given what we've received from the past and a decision among those possibilities for how to um, you know, interpret the past and how to try to influence what happens in the future. Whitehead will talk about how in more complex occasions of experience, um, there's a deeper participation in, in the future. There's a deeper um, consciousness of the effect of one's decisions in the present upon the future. Uh, and Whitehead thinks that, that you know, at the highest level, this is in human experience, one of the highest levels we know at least, this is where our moral um, our moral feelings come from. We think that we can affect the future through our decisions now. But this is prefigured in, in the experience of all life and, and for Whitehead of all, all um, physical process. There's this anticipation of the future and the conceptual phases of an experience are these anticipations of the future. For Whitehead, a conceptual feeling is um, is a feeling of, of abstract potentials that haven't yet been actualized. Um, you know, it, an eternal object is what a conceptual feeling is of. You know, we have conceptual feelings of eternal objects. And so the, there's the conformal phase, right? That's where we have physical feelings. 
And then there's this conceptual phase where we're feeling eternal objects. And then Whitehead will talk about what he calls contrasts or propositions, propositional feelings. Um, a propositional feeling is a contrast between a possibility and an actuality. It's a contrast between um, a conceptual feeling and a physical feeling. So in other words, a propositional feeling is comparing what, we's, what, what we have received from the, the environment with um, an idea about what could be present in the environment. And usually, Whitehead wants to distinguish what he means by proposition from what logicians usually mean. Um, because again, in, this more, in the more anthropocentric paradigm, that Whitehead's distancing in himself from, a proposition is a sentence. It has a subject and a predicate. Um, and, it, and a proposition is a conscious, a conscious judgment about reality. And Whitehead's saying that he's not talking about that kind of proposition. He's not just talking about what we can explicitly say and put in sentence form. He's talking about something way more basic, um, pre-linguistic, that's just at the level of feeling. It's the feeling of what is not, but could be. And he thinks this feeling is, um, it's, it's embodied and it's pre, it's pre linguistic and it's, it's fundamental for the creativity of nature. Um, it's the way that potentiality participates in actuality through propositional feelings. And, you know, Whitehead will say that consciousness, like, um, the ability to consciously apprehend what we experience is itself dependent on propositional feelings, but not all propositional feelings are conscious. So, you know, it's important to keep in mind that even though Whitehead is saying experience is pervasive in the universe, he's not saying consciousness as we usually think of it is pervasive. Um, and when we talk about the phases of an actual occasion of experience as it moves from the conformal phase to the conceptual phase to its satisfaction when it perishes and becomes a superject and then affects the future, um, very few actual occasions of experience actually attain consciousness. And in Whitehead's understanding of things, consciousness is a very late sort of derivative um, mode of experience. And it's very significant, especially for us, but um, it's, it's not actually the primary thing that's going on in this universe. And for the most part, in our human experience, we're not even, we're not conscious most of the time, you know? We're often living in emotion and in feeling and sort of immersed in our lives usually when we're conscious too often, we're, we're kind of depressed and anxious. So we don't want too much consciousness actually. Um, but nonetheless, consciousness is an instrument that can be refined. Um, and it has, it has religious significance, moral significance, political significance. It's essential for doing science. So, you know, what, we wouldn't want to belittle consciousness, but when we're doing cosmology, the, the tendency in the history of cosmology and philosophy has been to privilege and center consciousness, human consciousness. And Whitehead's really trying to say, yeah, it's really cool and everything, but let's just tone that down a bit and look at what else is going on here. So, you know, the subjectivist principle is something that Whitehead's reforming so that we don't put the human at the center of everything, but can look at subjectivity at a way more fundamental level than just what humans experience. You know, Whitehead's theory of perception is, I think, uh, counterintuitive at first, for sure. I understand why you, you feel like presentational immediacy is just that more, more immediate. Um, and sometimes Whitehead's terminology uh, undermines the ideas he's trying to convey. But so let me, let me frame it this way. Um, when we think of causal efficacy, what Whitehead really wants us to think of is uh, what he elsewhere, elsewhere in process and reality calls bodily reception 
or instead of sense perception, sense reception. And the thing is, obviously, we know we, we, we sense the world through our organs of, of perception, our eyes, our ears, right, our skin. We feel the world with our bodies. We, we know this is just obvious, right? Um, it goes without saying. You know, um, Whitehead in another book, uh, uh, Modes of Thought, he's like, you know, uh, philosophers have really um, taken for granted the relationship of their consciousness to their bodies. It's not like anyone shows up and says, here I am, and I've brought my body with me. Uh, you know, we just, we're so, our bodies are so transparent to us that when we try to analyze what it means to be conscious, what it means to sense the world, to perceive the world, um, Whitehead doesn't think we've paid due attention to the body. So when he talks about causal efficacy, he just means that we see with our eyes, which is to say that causal efficacy is, is the way that the light that's streaming in from the world is entering the lens of the eye, hitting the retina, and then being transmitted through a series of nerves, or in Whitehead's sense, through a historical route of actual occasions that goes into the brain and is um, there eventually received by what Whitehead will call, you know, the, um, the, the final or uh, dominant occasion of experience, which is our consciousness in any given moment. And it will display this world for us, a spatially extended world with objects in it that have colors. Um, but when he says causal efficacy is primary, he's saying, well, that spatially extended world is really a secondary projection of a causal process, which isn't just in our heads, but is in the world too. It's the light streaming in from the world. Um, he's not an idealist in the sense that he says all we experience is a brain construct, but he's saying the way our bodies are organized, like when we feel the weight of the stone in our hand, the weight of the stone in our hand is only possible for us to feel because of the causal efficacy in our nerve endings and our muscles that flow through our bodies, right? We only really feel our body when it's broken or when it's injured, right? It doesn't often appear. It's usually transparent to us. We don't notice that we see with our eyes unless we've got something in our eye. And then our, our vision blurs, we start tearing up, and we have to get it out before we can then see the world without worrying about the fact that we have an eye and that we see with an eye. So when the body's, when the sensory organs are working well, we don't notice them. Um, but when we have an earache, all of a sudden hearing becomes way more, it becomes way more obvious to us that there's a process of causal efficacy that precedes our sensory perception of sound and that the, our perception of sound or our visual perception of an extended world these are derivative experiences of something that is it is itself way more vague but definitely embodied definitely having to do with these physical organs um, that you know our organism has evolved so causal efficacy is, think of, when Whitehead talks about that, think of, um, you, know, you know, Whitehead's example that he loves is being tackled in rugby. Um, he was a star rugby player, right? And he says, being tackled at rugby, there is the real. Nobody who hasn't been knocked down has the slightest notion of what the real is. So, you know, Whitehead definitely is a realist in the sense that he's privileging causality as the primal source of all of our experience. But for him, causality is an exchange of feeling. Um, so causal efficacy is, is think of the feelings of your body, right? And your sense perception of the world beyond your body is what presentational immediacy is. But, but, but the way that your body at first receives the world is causal efficacy. That's Whitehead, by the way, as a rugby player in, um, ah. in college. Fun. Yeah, I think he was a hunk. I mean, geez. Okay. <laughs> you know, at, at one point in Process and Reality, um, I think in, it's not until part four, Whitehead says that the, 
you know, he says it's a sound doctrine that um, the human body and, and our biological organism should be understood according to the same principles that apply in the physical world. But he says this doctrine is double-edged because it means that our understanding of the physical world must also be interpreted in terms of how we understand our own living bodies. So in other words, um, our best, our most intimate contact with the way that the physical world is in its intrinsic nature is in our bodies. So the causal efficacy of feeling through our nerves and our nervous system, um, Whitehead wants to generalize that and say, oh, this is how causality works in the rest of nature too. It's just enhanced by our organism because our organism has evolved to amplify these feelings in a way that um, a rock hasn't. But even a rock is composed of really complex molecules and crystals that are channeling feeling in interesting ways. Um, organi biological organisms just really amplify that. And so he wants to build these analogies and say, look, biological organisms like ourselves and our own conscious experience, that's what physical process does. Um, and we are an example of a physical process. Wow, physics is not just extended matter in motion, right? That's the, uh, the argument that Whitehead is making. So yeah, the inversion of Plato is important. It's not a rejection of Plato. It's just a sense of Whitehead's giving more important importance to um, the physically experienced world uh, rather than to the perfect ideal. But um, Whitehead also doesn't think we can understand the physically actual experienced world without making reference to these eternal objects or these platonic forms. Um, because in, in order for the physically actual experienced world to be like anything, to be like anything definite that we can recognize, it needs to participate, Whitehead thinks, in these forms of possibility or these forms of definiteness, Whitehead calls them. Um, you know, when we, you know, this, I think there's a really simple proof of some form of platonic realism about the way that abstract ideas participate in our world. Um, I mean, mathematics is an obvious example, but, you know, when we talk about two-ness, you know, you can have two fingers, you can have two hands, you can have two people, you can have two of almost anything. You can have two very different objects, right? Like you could just, you could have an iPad and, and uh, headphone cases, but you know, there's two here. And what is this essence of two-ness that it can be exemplified in apparently infinitely many different ways? Um, how do we, th we, it's really hard for me to imagine that two-ness could just be kind of derived from many experiences of two things. It seems like we understand the world according to certain forms that we, we didn't just um, abstract out of the world of our experience, but that somehow, um, in Whitehead's words, ingress into our experience. So Whitehead will say that um, the redness of a sunset, like a particular hue, is not emergent from nature, but required for nature. It's not the, that particular shade of redness. I mean, obviously it required um, the sun to have a certain, um, you know, uh, ratio of, of atomic elements composing it and our atmosphere to have a certain molecular composition and our eyes to have evolved in a certain way so as to you know perceive the, the wavelengths of light all of that's necessary whitehead would say for red to ingress in 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 our experience but that ingression of red is it's whitehead's way of saying that um um the, the actual physical world, right? Like the sun and our organism um, is, is itself not, we're, we're, this world is not producing the possibilities. It's participating in the possibilities. Um, and redness itself is an eternal object 
that was always possible, but that ingressed in that in 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 any moment of our experience, um, because all the conditions were met that were required for its ingression. And so, yes, actual occasions choose eternal objects to characterize their experience. Um, this choosing, this decision happens in, in a particular phase of the process of concrescence. And some occasions of experience have more capacity to choose than others. This would be in the conceptual phase when an occasion would be choosing internal objects to interpret it, its experience. And, you know, one of the, the glories of consciousness is that, you know, we have this imaginative freedom to ingress possibilities and eternal objects. Um, we can create whole alternative worlds and write fantasy fiction by ingressing novel eternal objects. Um, and, you know, Whitehead is pushing against Hume's understanding of, of this imaginative freedom and saying, we're not, when we imagine alternative worlds, we're not just rearranging things we've already experienced in this world. Whitehead thinks we can actually draw upon a field of potential that's exemplified nowhere in this world. Um, he thinks we participate in a realm of potential that is required for this world and not emergent from this world, if that makes sense. Uh, and I think Whitehead has mathematical reasons for this, but he also has poetic and aesthetic reasons for it. Um, He's, he's a Platonist in the sense that he's not willing to get rid of the realm of ideas, but he's inverting Plato in that he's saying this realm of ideas isn't itself causing anything to happen. Um, you know, the form of horse doesn't cause the horse to emerge. The horse emerges in the course of evolution because many decisions of many actual occasions um, have arrived at that place such that the complex eternal object for horseness um, has ingressed. All of the causal activity, all of the decisions took place in the actual world. But nonetheless, this form of hoarseness um, was always possible. That's why it's eternal. Well, keep in mind that he doesn't think we can make reference to potentiality independently of actuality. So this realm of possibility this realm of eternal objects um, is meaningless in abstraction from the actual physical world that we experience. Um, eternal objects and the actual occasions require one another for their definitions. So um, he's not saying there is a realm, a heavenly realm of platonic ideas out there somewhere that's totally separate from this actual physical world. Um, what he's saying is that in order to understand our experience, we're always going to be encountering or living through this tension. It's a tension between potentiality, what's possible, and actuality, what's just given, what's brute fact. Um, and we can't understand nature as just a bunch of brute facts piling up on one another. Nature also participates in potentiality. And the way that novelty can ingress is that those brute facts are more than themselves. They're also, um, there's also conceptual feelings um, of what remains possible given what's already factually actualized. So it's more, for Whitehead, he's a thinker of polarities rather than dualities. And he's kind of, he's asking us to, you know, not take it seems like he has a duality between eternal objects and actual occasions, but he's, he's trying to develop a scheme of thought wherein these, these two abstractions, um, rather than being in a dualism with one another, are in a polarity with one another. And so that comprehending what he means requires holding the tension between them. Um, so it's, you know, part of his method is to, is to ask us to be comfortable holding the tension. Um, so, you know, he's a Platonist and he's an Aristotelian. And this word realism, you know, to say someone's a realist, 
we, there's, there's many meanings of the term. You can be a realist about ideas and the opposite of a realist in that sense would be a nominalist who thinks there are no eternal ideas. They're just words that we come up with. Um, abstract general terms. There are no real ideas or essences. It's just, we come up with names for things that are classes that include many particulars within the class. So there's the realism that's the opposite of nominalism. And then there's the realism, which is the opposite of like idealism, where an idealist might say, well, everything's really an appearance in the mind. And maybe not your personal mind, but like an absolute mind. Whitehead's not an idealist like that. He's a realist in the sense that he thinks, um, you know, reality is uh, constituted just as much by mind as it is by um, physical process. And there are real facts occurring in the world beyond um, even God's experience. Uh, you know, God has a very important role to play in Whitehead's cosmology and is in some ways the mind of the, of the universe or the soul of the world. Um, but Whitehead even there doesn't make God the sole experience or the preeminently real experience. All the rest of our experience is just as real as God's experience. So that's Whitehead's realism. Um, yeah. I hope that distinguishes just different ways we might use the term realist. Yes, because um, potentiality and actuality are always in relationship with one another. So any given actuality and one actual occasion of experience is what it is by virtue of not being what it isn't. Mm -hmm. That's obvious, right? That, that's to say that, you know, the eternal objects that each occasion has decided to ingress to characterize its, its experience those eternal objects are themselves connected to all the other eternal objects. And, uh, Whitehead says a sort of hierarchy of, of meaning. There are very simple eternal objects and there are more complex ones, right? And whenever an occasion ingresses some, it's sort of indirectly still referring to all the rest of the eternal objects in the infinite field of potential. But an actuality becomes just what it is. It becomes a unique addition to the creative advance um, by negatively prehending all the potentialities that it has decided against. Mm -hmm. It decides and on just those potentialities. It connects to Whitehead's understanding of God, which, you know, when, if we were to ask the question, well, where are these eternal objects? Whitehead's answer says, well, they're in, they're in the experience of God. God is an, is an actual entity, of, an actual occasion of experience who was the initial one to feel the realm of potential and subjectively respond to it. And that initial subjective response by God to the infinite realm of potential, is sort of like, it's like the cosmic genetic code that every subsequent occasion of experience is, is inheriting and responding to. Um, not, it's not every other occasion is not determined by that genetic code just like we're not determined by our genetic code. Um, but it does give us a sort of um, scaffold to build on. And so the realm of, we don't, Whitehead does think that we experience the realm of potential um, in some ways directly, but initially we always experience it mediated through God. So we initially experience the realm of eternal objects that infinite potentiality, we experience it through God, God mediates it for us. And yet after that initial mediation by God, especially more complex occasions can, we can sort of peek behind the curtain and experience what God experiences and ingress possibilities and value things that God would think are less than kosher. Um, and you know, this is why we're not determined by God. If, if we didn't, if each occasion of experience didn't have its own immediate access to the realm of possibility, um, then we would just obey what God told us about that realm. But Whitehead is leaving room for us, even though God's way of valuing possibility is dominant because 
Whitehead thinks that's why there's any order at all. But there's chaos too, and that's because there's deviation, there's creativity, um, there's, you know, the universe is music, but it's more like jazz. It's not this really confined classical composition. Um, nobody knows what's going to happen next. Not even God knows what's going to happen next. Um, it's because potentiality is always present. Uh, even though pigs aren't going to necessarily start flying tomorrow, right? Some potentialities are less probable than others because of the weight of history that we're always inheriting. Can't do whatever we want. We have to fit into our environment. The first thing I want to say is I think one of the difficulties here is the different levels of generality um, that Whitehead is working at when he refers to an object. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think I counted three different meanings of the term object that are at three different levels of generality. Right, right. What you were asking. So when an actual occasion, you know, it, it's, it begins inheriting the perished experience of the past, the objects in its environment, bringing them into subjective immediacy, and then it achieves its satisfaction, becomes a superject, the subject becomes a superject, perishes into the future and as an object. Right. Um, and so that's on the basic level, like that's the foundational metaphysical level. An object is a perished subject of experience or a superject. Um, there's another level of generality when we talk about what Whitehead calls an enduring object. Mm -hmm. That's what we usually experience in the world are these enduring objects, the pyramids at Giza, our own bodies, the tables and chairs and the rooms that we are spending most of our time in. Like, these are enduring objects. And in Whitehead's technical language, they're societies of actual occasions that have ingressed these characteristics, these definite characteristics They've ingressed eternal objects um, that they, the actual occasions composing those societies are repeating in a very regular way. So the pyramids stay the pyramids because they're ingressing the complex eternal object of pyramid. Um, I stay Matt because I'm ingressing the complex eternal object of Matt. Um, but this is at a second order level of generality. Those actual occasions ex of experience inheriting the past into subjective immediacy, perishing into objects. Then there are these, at a higher level, societies of actual occasions or enduring objects right. that endure because of what they're, the eternal objects that they're ingressing. And that's the third sense of object is the eternal object. Well, because that's the other thing. The pyramids at Giza are wasting away. Right. Our bodies are aging. The, the wood and the table is slowly being, you know, rotted. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's just that the time scale is long enough for those things to happen that we don't notice it. And we just think, Oh yeah, that's a solid object. It's the same now as it was 10 minutes ago. And it will be the same 10 years from now. Um, I mean, in, in the case of our bodies, like we notice when we age um, and this is a fact of what it means to live in a universe of process that things age um, and some things age faster than other things. Right. Um, but nothing is, yeah, no thinker thinks twice. You can't step into the same river twice. And in Whitehead's universe, uh, the pyramid at Giza is an enduring object, but in any given moment, for it to endure, that endurance depends upon countless actual occasions of experience, right. inheriting the past and thrusting their experience into the future. Um, that's why it endures. It's this continual pulsation of, quant of events going down to the quantum right. level. Whitehead, Whitehead's saying that God is as subject to that creative action as the rest of us are, which is to say God is a creature of creativity. And like I was saying earlier, God is like the initial kind of filter or, or God mediates between us and raw potential. This raw potential, it's like it would just rip us apart. But the thing is, human, I think, so, yeah, God's the, God mediates between us and that creative action that you're describing. God is itself a, um, 
a sort of expression of that creativity. Those are, there's such important conversations to have, you know, for all the reasons I was saying earlier that, um, you know, religious feelings have always been the prime motor of human transformation. Um, and we can be spiritual and not religious, but I think, and that works for a lot of people, but for mass transformation to happen, it's gotta be religion and sp- it's, it's got to be spirituality in the context of the religious traditions. And mm-hmm, right. thinkers like Whitehead help us uh, reform the existing traditions. Like Whitehead's not trying to, he's not a, he's not a rebellious Promethean thinker as radical as his ideas are. He's really trying to preserve um, the tradition of modern philosophy, the tradition of science, poetry, literature, um, common sense he, he, he's not trying to say that you're all wrong and i finally got the right answer i mean he's proposing some radical ideas but he's really trying to make such an effort to connect with you know what we all assume is true already um and for him metaphysics is really just the search for what is obviously true he says whitehead says i think it's in his book um introduction to mathematics he says um, it takes a very unusual mind to undertake an analysis of the obvious. That is precisely what metaphysics and philosophy is, an analysis of the obvious. The things that are so obvious that we don't even notice, we don't even bother to mention. We just take them for granted. Metaphysics is just surfacing those things. Um, so, but, you know, when Whitehead thinks of God, God's not just sort of the creative agent or the creative action. That's like God as divine eros, right? This is a Greek term kind of meaning like desire. God is eros, but God is also pathos because God, there, there's the primordial nature of God as divine eros, but God is consequent also, which is divine pathos. Right. The feeling, the, 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 the reception of everything that all the other creatures decide to do. God initiates right. experience for every creature and God receives what each, what each creature decides to do with that experience, right? God is eros and pathos. Oh, and the, I mean, this, this issue of the, the pronouns is interesting, he, whether we refer to God as he, she, or yeah, he. I, no, but it, I mean, Whitehead says he, you know? Right. Um, but I think for Christians and for um, Muslims and for Jews and for any other theistic religion, God is a person. And right. to use a pronoun really doesn't allow us to describe the true nature of, of God, right? Right. And one of the interesting things in Whitehead's theology is the reason he distinguishes between creativity and God is because creativity is impersonal. All creativity, cre- creativity doesn't want anything. <laughs> right. It doesn't value anything. It's just pure potential. God values something specific. And definite. God is a, you know, God does have a personal nature for Whitehead in the mm-hmm. sense that um, God is a soul, soul of the whole world, but a soul nonetheless um, that longs and yearns for something. And that yearning is for beauty. And beauty for Whitehead just means more and more intense harmonizations. Uh, and contrasts among things that initially don't hang together. You know, the evolutionary process is this constant experimentation with novelty. And God is trying to direct all that experimentation towards the most beautiful, complex, intense experience imaginable, which isn't just all pleasure and joy. Um, You know, for Whitehead, tragedy is the highest form of beauty. And so the story of the universe for Whitehead is beautiful because of its mm-hmm. tragedy. Tragedy in like the, the Greek dramatic sense. Right. Um, so that you're like laughing and crying and um, it's, over, it's, it's sublime beauty. Uh, not just like, oh, that's a pretty picture and everybody lives happily ever after. But like, you know, more like a sense of adventure. Like, I can't believe we survived that. The, you know, Whitehead's an atomist, he tells yeah. us, right? He atomizes becoming, and he says that his atoms aren't like, you know, 
um, Newton's particles by any stretch, but they're occasions of the experience and they're all related to one another. But nonetheless, he's an atomist in the sense that he thinks there's not a seamless continuity of becoming. He thinks that becoming is, has this pulse to it. Um, and the reason he does that, well, there are, I, there are two basic reasons. Uh, one is psychological and one is physical. He thinks quantum physics shows us that nature comes in wave packets and there's no nature at an instant, um, but nor is nature simply continuous. There seems to be a vibratory pattern um, at work at the quantum level, at, at the smallest level we can measure. There is vibration, which is to say, um, you know, when we talk about photons and electrons and everything, we're, we're talking about a complete movement. Um, you can't, have an electron at an instant, you can't have a photon at an instant. There's, you know, Max Planck is, you know, the, the notion of um, Planck time or Planck's length uh, is, is this idea that to have a whole photon, it's, it takes a certain amount of duration for a photon to manifest itself as a photon. Um, and so Whitehead takes from quantum physics this idea that nature comes in quanta. But he also takes from psychology and specifically from William James's psychology that uh, our conscious experience comes in drops and buds, that there are these buds of experience that build on the last experience. Um, and that whatever our, our, our consciousness is a stream, but it's also a stream that is, it comes in globular form. Like there are droplets of water composing the stream um, and that each moment of our experience is unique in the sense that it's building on what came before it. And if there was just a continuity, Whitehead thinks there'd be no way for us to really um, explain freedom and creativity because you, you do need some sense of a break with the past, Whitehead thinks, in order to account for a creative thought or creative experience. Mm -hmm. um, and so he draws a lot on William James's psychology and Whitehead's description of an actual occasion as a drop of experience straight out of James. But it's not just James's psychology, it's also quantum physics. And so Whitehead thinks, ah, there's an analogy here between our psychological experience and the quantum level of the physical world that suggests that reality has a, um, a quantum nature or an atomic nature that it comes in these, these discrete pulses of actuality rather than just being a continuous flow. And I get why you're challenged by that. I mean, it's, it's maybe you want to contest Whitehead. <laughs> you prefer continuity. I think thinkers like um, Charles Saunders Peirce mm -hmm. and uh, Bergson, mm -hmm. they're, 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 they're thinkers of process as continuity, whereas Whitehead and James are thinking it more in these, um, mm -hmm. in the terms of a vibration. Mm 